The New Testament reading is Revelation chapter 21, beginning with the 10th verse. John the seer writes, And in the spirit, an angel carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven with God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord, God Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of moon to shine or sun to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of earth shall bring their glory into it, and the gates shall never be shut by day, and there shall be no night there. Enter it, they shall bring into the glory and the honor of nations, and there shall be no night there but nothing unclean shall enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street in the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 fruits, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits and of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Behold, the Lamb says, I am coming soon. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, we have just heard some of the final verses of the most misunderstood book of the New Testament, uh, the book of Revelation. You know, before I get to this verse here, we, we, let's spend some time, do a little Bible study together on this book of Revelation. Um, you should know that the book of Revelation is a part of a particular genre of writing in the ancient world known as apocalyptic. Now, we got genres of writing in our time. You go to the bookstore, you see history, you see science, self-help. In the ancient world, you had genres as well, one of them being apocalyptic writing. Now, the word apocalypse usually uh, uh, conjures up for us like images of uh, uh, like a Bruce Willis action film, right? There are just destruction and meteors crashing to earth and, you know, devastation. The word apocalypse literally means in the Greek this. It means an unveiling, a lifting of the veil, a kind of a peering behind the curtain to see what is uh, hidden to us. And so throughout this letter, John is writing these Christians and he's trying to get them to peer behind the curtain to see the world as it is and to see the world as it shall be despite what the evening news would have these early Christians to believe. Now, the key, well, probably the chief characteristic of apocalyptic writing is the use of really kind of obscure images. I mean, how many of you, kind of a show of hands, uh, how many of you ever tried to stroll through the book of Revelation before? You ever tried to do anybody in here? Yeah. You get about two chapters and you were just encountered with all of these beasts and dragons and horns and, and bowls of wrath poured out upon the earth. And this trips a lot of people up. It really does. But what we need to recall is that in the ancient days, the Christians, this would have been understandable to them. They knew what John 
was talking about when he was using all these wild and just, just crazy images. I'll give you an example right now. Here we go. Shane's apocalypse. And, and what I'm going to do, just imagine you're, you and I are living 2,000 years ago, but based on current events. Now imagine this. Imagine I wrote all of you this letter and I said this. Hang with me. On the sixth day of the 11th month of the 2012th year, I, Shane, saw a great beast, a donkey, rising from a throne in the east. And the number of the donkey was 43. All right? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about already. And then in the Midwest, I saw another beast, a great elephant, rising from the state of the land called 23. That's Michigan, by the way. All right? And then over the land of the river called Ohio, the beast clashed. And there was a great war, and the donkey consumed the elephant, and the donkey reclaimed his seat on the throne for another quadrennia. <laughs> now, I just used some really obscure language to describe what? The last presidential election between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, right? We know what donkeys mean. Democrat, we know what elephants mean. Republican, that's exactly what would have happened. So when the Christians, when John was writing the Christians and using all this beast image, they would have understood exactly what that means, just like what I said to you. That means Rome. That means the empire and all of the emperors that occupied the throne in those days. See, Rome in those days, they, they uh, vaunted itself. Rome just vaunted itself, boasted and, and Rome boasted that it was the source of the world's salvation. It is the source of the world's economic wealth. It is the source of opportunity and everything else. See, Rome had propaganda in those days. And a part of Rome's propaganda was to kind of disseminate this message to all the rest of the world. Hey, you follow Rome. You do what we do. And you're going to enjoy peace. You're going to enjoy security. You're going to enjoy opportunity. Abundant life if you just do what we say. But John is writing to the Christians, and he's saying, you know, Rome presents itself as being beautiful. I tell you, it's not beautiful. It's a beast. It's a beast. And you follow Rome, Christian people, and you're going to be a part of a peace secured by violence. You're going to participate in an economy that just crushes the poorest of people to benefit the really the wealthiest people up here. You are going to give your loyalty, Christians, to a government that hails itself as being the savior of the world, but it ain't the savior of the world. And that's not the real emperor. Jesus is the real emperor. He's the world's salvation. That. So, I hate to use this cliche, but when you read the book of Revelation, it's really the tale of two cities. On the one hand, you got the city of Rome, all of its splendor that John says is actually oppression, guised as security and peace. That's the one city. Then on the other hand is the other city, the city of God. John often calls the city of God the New Jerusalem, where God's people remain loyal to the earth's and the world's true Lord, and it's not Caesar, it's Jesus the Lamb. But for those of you who are going to remain loyal to this Jesus, he says, over and over again, you're going to find yourself in prison. You might get persecuted. You might even get killed. But for those who keep the faith, that's a recurring message in Revelation. For those who keep the faith and endure, you're going to see the world as it shall be and as it was meant to be. And that finally brings us to this image right here that was just read to us. John, in this last couple of chapters of his letter, he, he pulls back the curtain just a little bit more so that we might see something greater, the world as it meant to be. And John says something like this. He says, and I saw the city of God. I saw the new Jerusalem coming, listen to this, coming down out of heaven from God. That's important. And then he goes and talks about how he sees a world in which there are no longer any temples. There are no more churches. There are no more synagogues. But instead, the entire world itself will be this large altar where the entire presence of God will be saturated throughout the world. John goes and talks about governments no longer investing in the military-industrial complex. He talks about the nations and kings of the world signing peace treaties. He talks about fair wages where there's not going to be any more famines, no more war, where God is going to be all in all. 
Now, here's the point that I want us to make. And this is critical. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. This vision of John's revelation, this apocalypse of his, peering back the curtain, this is very much a vision of this world, of our world, of our creation. And that was always the great hope of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. It was the great hope of Jesus. It was the great hope of the early church. In other words, hear this. In other words, the ultimate hope of the book of Revelation is not that we're going to go up into heaven, but that heaven's going to do what? Come down to earth. We pray this prayer every week in here. But we don't pay attention to it. What do we say every week in the Lord's Prayer? We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The vision of Revelation is not us going up. The ultimate vision is that heaven is going to come down into this world. This world. Well, that's, that's, that's something, isn't it? I mean, that, that, that's radical. That means... Uh, and I hate to disappoint the Hollywood directors among us, or the uh, soon-to-be. That means, get this, that means the Scriptures teach that there really is no such thing as the end of the world. There's no such thing as the end of the world. And this is, these are some more words, you know. Now, I know we love, we love end-of-the-world talk, right? We, like, get riveted on TV. Somebody's pr- predicting doom, you know. The end of the world, Y2K, <laughs> You know, the Mayan calendar, boom. You know, like this idea that the world is just going to completely vanish. That's not what the scriptures teach at all. And we sing this every Sunday. You just sang it a few minutes ago. It was right there in black and white. You've been singing this for years. All right, here's what we're going to do. The glory of Patri, the glory to the Father. Patrick, I want you to play it. Hit it, Sam. And then we're going to sing this, and I want you to pay attention to some words here. All right, go for it. Let's sing this. All right, let's go. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Good. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Here we go. There it is, world without end. You know, I don't, don't be disappointed. We sing that every week. You know, really, the, the, the best, the, the best uh, theologians on this point, I'm serious about this. This is silly now, but the best theologians on this point is the band R.E.M. Now, some of you remember growing up in the 80s. You know this even if you didn't grow up in the 80s. There's song, right? You can fill in the blanks for me. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. Well, I don't want to go there. But that's more what John is trying to say in this letter than this idea that we're just going to float up off in the clouds and we're going to be there forever and that's the end of the story. John is actually saying to the Christians living under the Roman Empire, the world's going to end, but it's going to be the world as we know it today. The world of racism. The world of suffering. The world of cancerous tumors. The world of gun deaths. The world of Boston bombers, that world is going to come to an end. But the world as God wants it to be, the world as God intends it to be, the the world where it's going to be just filled with praise and thanksgiving and glory, where we can all say together, finally, the words of the first chapter of Genesis, when God said, it is good, it is fully good. We can't say it's fully good yet. But Revelation is saying there's a time going to come where we're going to be able to say at the world, it is, it is fully good. That world, God is going to bring that world to fruition. And that's the world that we are going to live in. And what a, what a radically different thing to say, right? What a radically different thing to say than we hear a lot of non-religious people saying about Christianity and about Christians. And you've heard this before. I have a lot of people, heard a lot of people say, oh, those silly little Christians. You know, they, they just... 
They're just so pie in the sky, right? They just have their heads up there in the clouds. They just think about heaven, and they're not very concerned with the things that are going on on this earth. They're just not concerned at all. Pie in the sky, that kind of language. And the scriptures, we just heard it. It teaches the exact opposite. I mean, we should be, according to the Bible, we should be of all people the most concerned about the stuff that goes on into this, into this world. I mean, John's vision here to the early church, this vision of a renewed earth, this vision where the earth is going to be filled with praise and thanksgiving and the nations of the world are going to put down their arms, this is not a way of John to say, hey, you Christians out there, just, just hang tight. You know, play the waiting game, and uh, pretty soon we'll, it'll all be better in the sweet by and by. You just hang out. No. This vision that concludes the book of Revelation is actually a vision of protest. It's a vision of protest. I mean, since the world, this creation was meant to sing praise to God. We're going to sing in the doxology a minute. You know, praise God, all creatures here below. That's supposed to be the world. And since that is not happening, where the world is not a place of full worship, and instead it seems to be ruled by another power, John called it Rome, oppression, war, violence, exploitation, then, then that means that we Christian people, the church, we should be of all people in the world the ones who say, we got to draw the line here. No. I mean, according to John, we should be of all people who insist on economic fairness. We should insist on food for everyone. We should insist on an end to nuclear armaments and drone strikes and guns for everybody. Why? Because according to this book, those things will have no place. They will have no place in the new creation when it comes. John is saying to the Christians, you better live now and care for the things now that are going to be the reality when the new earth comes to being. We, we kind of miss this point. You know, we kind of think that, oh, we're supposed to be kind and we're supposed to be forgiving and we're supposed to be merciful because, frankly, that's just a better way to live your life. And most of you know that if you're kind and merciful and forgiving in this world, boy, somebody can take advantage of you in a heartbeat. It's not a better way to live. But we are supposed to be kind and loving and forgiving because in the new creation, what's it going to be? It's going to be kindness and mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation. Be now, church what reality is going to be in the new earth. And I saw a great vision, John says, the city of God, and it came out of heaven. The place where God dwells set up its shop in the place where we dwell. A little bit later, John says, and God will dwell among human beings. The new earth, that's the vision. You know, I had the disciples, think about this, and I'll be finished. Had the early disciples gone around Jerusalem, gone around Rome, and if they had gone around saying to people, hey, there's life after death. You know, when you, when you die, you go to heaven, and that's the end of the story. You know what people would have said in response to the disciples? They'd have been like, Ugh. everybody believes that. The Romans believed that. The Greeks believed that. Everybody believed in some place up in the clouds. But the church believes something far greater. They believe that the God's kingdom would come, that God's will would be done, not up there, but on earth as it is in heaven. That means the world matters. Creation matters, folks. I mean, the world as we see it, we are supposed to be worshiping a God in the midst of a power like Caesar that thinks it's got the last say. We really think that the weapons industry has the final say in this life, but John is saying, no, you keep worshiping the lamb. He's the real savior. You be faithful to that, and you will be able to see at long last heaven coming to earth. Jesus shall return the lamb. He will raise even the dead so that they and us can see the world and experience the world as God meant it to be, a world of praise, a world of thanksgiving, a world of justice, a world of righteousness, where we will say it is good, it is good, it is good. And that shall be the world that shall be without end. A new heaven, a new earth, together, God's world shall truly be God's world, live now 
as though it's come because it's on the way. Thanks be to God.